One of the most common pieces of business advice that you're going to hear is to charge what you are worth. Have you ever heard that before? And let me tell you why that is such a bad idea. Because how much are you worth? The language matters. When you start thinking, I'm worth this much, I'm worth that much, what happens is you start putting monetary value based on your self esteem. You, you connect monetary value to your self esteem and to your, you know, uh, you, you also esteem other people based on how much they charge. Is that true? Is that really how we want to relate to other people based on how much people charge, is how much they are worth to us and how much we're worth to ourselves? It's terrible. Who started this lie of charge what you're worth? I mean, I understand um, maybe the, the people who are promoting this idea want you to, to have self-care. You know, want you to make sure that you are taking care of your finances and your family and your needs. Yes, yes, and yes. I'll talk about that later. I call that enoughness, okay? But to, let's just do away with the entire idea of charge what you're worth. Let's do it away. And every time you hear people say that, please point them back to this video or, or just to explain why that is such a, um, a deeply misleading idea because it connects money to self-worth. And that's a very dangerous thing because people then start to do what? They start to try to keep up with the Joneses. You may have heard that term. Basically, well, I, you know, a so-and-so that I, you know, a competitor of mine has a bigger house, so I'm going to have to get an even bigger house than him. Uh, so and so, you know, has a nice car. Well, I better get a even nicer car. Or wow, look at so and so just came back from that kind of vacation. Well, I better, you know, go on vacation as good as that. You start connecting what people have and what people make and the kind of experiences they have with how much they are worth as a human being, and you start to look at yourself and make those kinds of judgments as well. And that is a recipe for. A, um, a vicious life, to be honest. That's what it is. Uh, it's viciousness towards your, your, your own true worth, and it's kind of vicious thinking towards other people. So let's not charge what, our, what we're worth, because we are worth infinite. How much are you worth? You cannot calculate. You, you are a child of God. So how much are you worth? You can't calculate that, okay? Now, it makes a bit more sense to say charge what your services are worth, but you know, I, I, it's, it's a little bit too close to the idea of charge what you're worth. I don't even wanna say that. Okay, so let's, let's talk about some of the other um, relative lies in this arena, and then I'll get to what I recommend. So another, another common one is, this comes from economics, charge what the market will bear. Have you ever heard that before? Charge what the market will bear. That's what we're taught in economics, you know, in business schools. And that's, again, the language matters in how we think about other people, how we think of our customers, our audience, how we relate to them. So if I told you I was going to charge what the market will bear, you know what? You, those of you watching this, you're my market. So how do you feel if I'm going to tell you, I'm, I'm going to charge as much as you are able to bear? Like, I'm going to charge the maximum amount until you feel like, oh, my God, it's barely almost too much. That's what charge what the market will bear means. So that, again, is founded on this idea that we are all supposed to be out for ourselves. I should be out for myself, so I should charge you as much as I possibly can get away with. And you should be out for yourself. You should always be suspicious of me, the seller. You should buyer beware. You should always be suspicious of me and, you know, and, and assume that I'm only out for my own good and you should be out for your own good. So we should just be in battle. We should just, we should just go at each other. I'm going to charge you. I'm going to try to trick you and, and persuade you and do whatever I can to get you to pay as much as possible. And you do whatever you can to suspect and you know have to do a lot of due diligence because you can't possibly trust me so that's what economics modern contemporary economics assumes that that's how we should treat each other 
And those values have become widespread, uh, especially on the internet, right? Char and so my, my, uh, I'm, my constant effort is to try to bring higher values into business so that we can relate to each other with how we really want to relate to each other. You know, when we reconnect to our source, when we soften our hearts, we realize that we want to trust each other. You want to trust that I'm not going to try to charge you as much as possible, right? And, and I want to trust that you can trust me. <laughs> and like, I'm trying to look out for you and you're trying to look out for me, like compassion being the way that we relate to each other instead of, as they say, dog eat dog, right? So another third, a third um, dangerous thought to this whole valuing our services is charge the value of the service not by the hour, not by your time. Have you ever heard that? Oh, charge, not, don't charge for your time. Charge for the value that your product or service provides. Okay, all right. That's all, again, that sounds good, right? That so sounds right, I think. Well, let's think it through and let's see what the values are underneath it and this, why it doesn't work for a lot of people, okay? Let's say that I am a, uh, you know, a relationship coach, uh, a marriage coach. And I'm going to help you keep your marriage. Okay. How much is it going to cost you to have a divorce? And literally, this is how people sell their services. How much would it be if, if you had to get a divorce? The divorce costs at, what, at least tens of thousands of dollars, depending on your income and your assets, obviously. For some people, it could cost, uh, cost millions of dollars to, to get into a divorce, right? Because they have to split their income and they split their assets and all that stuff and cost millions of dollars. So, since you, it'll cost you a million dollars if you get a divorce, then I'm gonna try to save you from that divorce. So, my service to you will only be a hundred thousand dollars. I'm giving you such a good deal. I'm saving you from a million dollar divorce here. I'm gonna only charge you a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, it's gonna take me a few dozen hours of work. But a hundred, do, do you see how insane that sounds? Okay, now another, another example. Let's say that I'm a occupational therapist and I help you heal your physical body so that you can get back to work. Well, how much is that worth to you? What's the value of my service? It's, you're, you know, maybe you weren't able to work for a year or two and now you're able to work, you know, you, you, you wouldn't have been able to get, get back to work for another year or two, let's say. Let's say, let's say two years, you can't get, get back. Now with my help, you can get back to work in six months. So you've just recovered a month, a year and a half of income. Okay, let's say you make $50,000 a year. That's $75,000 that my service is worth to you. That's the value of my service. So I'm only gonna charge you $15,000 to get $75,000 of value. Do you see how it's, it becomes ludicrous, the, the, these values that people are charging? Because why, is that, why doesn't that make sense? Because I can't guarantee I can't guarantee this, that you're going to save, you know, who knows? Maybe you would have healed in three months without my help instead of six months. Maybe you would never have gotten a divorce even without using my marriage coaching services. There is no guarantee. That's why when people lie to you and say, oh, I'm charging the value of my service. You're like, that's a lie because there, you can't, you don't know my future. You can't predict the future. Yeah, you could say, well, science, scientific studies say, but well, I'm not a scientific study. You know, I have, there's so many factors that doesn't fit into my life, doesn't fit into those scientific studies or whatever you might call it, right? So it, stop, stop saying charge for the value of your services rather than for your time. Ridiculous. So don't charge what you're worth. Don't charge what the market will bear. Don't charge for the value of your services, you know. So what, what, what do I recommend in, instead that has us relating to each other from a place of compassion and understanding and love instead of adversarial, you know, I'm just trying to take as much money from you as possible, right? So let's talk about the, the it's kind of what I came to eventually. I mean, what, what happened, those of you who've been following me for a while know that I had a kind of a personal spiritual transformation, um, I would say back in 2013. 20, 2012 was really kind of where I um, where I kind of started that. 2013 was a 
roller coaster year for me as I try to integrate, you know, what I was kind of going through. 2014, I kind of basically restarted my business from screen, you know, almost from scratch, not entirely, but um, I shut down all of my previous services and programs because I was charging the value of my products each course. You know how my online courses now are sixty dollars. Do you know how much they used to be? Two thousand dollars. Yeah, two thousand bucks. Now, yes, those two thousand dollar courses included more, but you know, I you know no, not not that much more. Okay. So I charge two thousand dollars now. I charge sixty dollars now. Maybe next year I'll charge seventy-five or a hundred for a course, but not two thousand like I used to. Okay, so, um, so so the, what I eventually came to as I had this spiritual transformation, realizing that we, I believe, I came to this belief that we are all deeply, deeply, deeply taken care of. We are all going to be okay that we don't have to fight so hard to try to uh, get things from other people. Um, I don't know what your belief system is. I'll, I'll just take, take Jesus. A lot of you believe, you know, in Christianity. Jesus says, why are you struggling so much? You know, look at the birds of the air, right? Um, they, don't, they don't struggle so much, and, but yet they're clothed wonderfully. You know, uh, they don't gather into barns Please give me the right quote here. But um, Jesus says, you know, don't, don't worry so much about the future. You know, you're going to be taken care of. You're going to be fine. Pursue first the kingdom of God, whatever that means to you, and God's righteousness, and everything else will be given to you as well. Now, I've been trying to communicate that idea to you now for four years, which is care more, right? Care versus what other people are doing. That's the kingdom of God and his righteousness, right? In business, it means to care, to understand your audience and to provide them what they really want and need at a really, really reasonable price where they're like, oh my God, this is such a good deal, right? That is the kingdom of God and his righteousness in business. And everything else tends to follow. Jesus says, well, and everything else will be given to you. Well, in business, the same thing. If you care, if you, if you care enough to understand your audience, and, and provide the kind of services and products that they want at a price that they say, oh my God, this is such a good deal. And how come you care, you, lo you love me so much? You, how come you, you show so much care in, in your products and in your content? Well, of course I'm going to buy from you. Of course I'm gonna tell everybody I know about you. It, everything else will be given to you as well. That's not what other, not that I hear what other business coaches and marketing coaches are not, you know, some others are great, right? But, um, but most of them aren't doing this, right? Most of them are, are teaching you this adversarial nature of business. And it's very, it's exhausting. And it takes you away from what I believe is a deeper life purpose and mission. Um, it's, it's disintegrated, disintegrated from your own, or not, I don't want to assume what yours is, but if you're following me, you, we probably have a similar life mission, which is to, love, to learn to love to learn to love, of course, ourselves unconditionally, but learn to love others unconditionally too. And, and to figure out what that means. How, how do we do that? How do we embody that in our work and in our business and in our pricing? So what I came to then was enoughness and compassion. Enoughness and compassion. That's my pricing strategy. So enoughness is what do I really need to have enough? Not what do I, how can I, last year I was at six figures and how can I get to six and a half figures this year? Why? Why? Why, why do you always want to make more and more and more money? Oh, because some business coach inspired me to make more money. Why? Because if you make more money, that means you have to charge your clients more probably, or at least you have to try to get more people to buy from you, which is in itself, if you try to, if you make numbers the goal because you just want more and more and more, then you're going to have to do more persuasion or you're going to have to, you, you, you're going to tie your sense of success to how many people are buying from you and how much they're paying you because now you want to make seven figures instead of six. What the hell, who the hell told you this? I mean, why, wh whose success metric are you following? Is that what your deepest soul is saying? Well, yes, I need to make more money. Why? Why? 
I, I honestly am baffled. Well, because it's about expansion. You know, it's expanding my soul. Well, expanding your soul has nothing to do with money for crying out loud, right? Look at Peace Pilgrim. Look at Gandhi. You know, look at expanding your soul. Look at all the saints of past that you respect. You know, just, just Jeff Bezos, he's the richest guy. Does he have the biggest soul in the world? I mean, yeah, I'm sure his soul is quite big, but not, I don't think Jeff Bezos has a bigger soul than Peace Pilgrim. Uh, if you don't know Peace Pilgrim, please, please go and listen to her audiobook, Steps to Inner Peace. It changed my life. That's one of the things that changed my life a couple years ago. Um, profound. Uh, it's available on SoundCloud for free. I think it still is. But anyway, you should, you'll be able to find it. Find it on YouTube, Steps to Inner Peace by Peace Pilgrim. Listen to the audiobook. It's life-changing. Um, so does Jeff Bezos and Warren Buffett have the biggest souls because they are the richest? That. Okay, or look at the everyday heroes in, in, in your neighborhood. You know, look at the, every, like who has, like, I don't want to judge who has bigger souls, but it can't be how much money somebody has. That, that's ridiculous. And, but, but that's the, that's the sort of the, the, you know, I don't want to say the law of attraction necessarily, but the law of attraction has some of this insidious root lies that are there that people don't question. Law of attraction is not all bad. It's just the idea that, Somehow, yes, we want soul expansion, but does soul expansion mean monetary accumulation and more income? No, it doesn't. It's something else to do with it. It's not that more money is bad. It's not, 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 not true either, but it's not, it's, not, it's not tied together. You see what I mean? Now, not having enough money can also be soul crushing, right? So it, it's, it's not the amount of money and soulfulness is not tied. It's, it's like two separate tracks. You can have somebody like St. Francis who had a vow of poverty, who had a, an enormous soul, huge soul, probably rewarded, you know, with a, a gazillion dollars, dollars in heaven, right? Like, like it, it's not connected. So, so this ridiculous idea of, I made six figures last year. Now I got to make seven. So that why? Because I have a more ex expansiveness, not contraction. That's ridiculous. Let's separate soul and money. Okay. Let's separate it. When you have, when you work on your soul, you'll be given enough money and you'll, maybe you'll be given a lot of money. Maybe you'll be given a little, it doesn't, but you can still use whatever you're given and bless so many people, especially nowadays with the internet, you don't have to have money to bless people. Um, so I actually in a in a couple of weeks I'm gonna do a book review on the science of getting rich, which is one of the books that uh, underpins the law of attraction and underpins a lot of the expansive thinking these days. Expansion, you know, it, this garbage about expansion and contraction. Not garbage, sorry. There is something there, energetic expansion and contraction, but it, people tie it to money and things and experiences, and I think it's very dangerous. It's, it's more than that. It's much more than that. It's much more than that. So enoughness means you don't always have to keep making more and more money. Now, yes, there is such a thing as inflation. Inflation is about 3% a year, at least in the U.S. So technically, you do need to make more money forever. But like 3%, cost of living, you know, cost of, cost of living adjustment, okay, COLA, right? That, that makes sense. But to keep making more and more money forever is questionable. Okay, so I live in San Francisco. I need more money than probably most of you, okay? Because San Francisco is super expensive. George, why don't you move? Yes, I know. I have thought about moving for a lot, a lot of times, but right now my wife has, you know, bless her, she's built a, a, a clientele here that she really loves, and she need, we need to stay here in San Francisco, so I'm sorry I have to charge my rates that I do. But if I lived in Mexico, if it was really up to me only, which is not, of course, in the marriage, but if it's up to me only, I'd live in Thailand or Mexico or, or Indonesia or, or I don't know about Indonesia, but maybe that's already expensive nowadays. But, but somewhere where I could charge you not $200 an hour, I could charge you $40 an hour and be fine. I would charge you 40 bucks an hour if I could, honestly. Um, but I live in San Francisco, so I charge $200 an hour. I know that's a lot, but it's still not compared to my peers who charge $500 to $1,000 an hour, yes, um, not all my peers, but I have people at a similar level levels me who charge at least $500 an hour. So, um, $200 an hour is a lot, I know, but it's, 
my level of experience. So, so enoughness, my enoughness is probably more than your enoughness, unfortunately. But I am also trying to, you know, be be conscious of not just keep expanding my my quality of life or not quality of life. I shouldn't even say that, right? Quality of life. A lot of people connect that to well, how much money you spend. Again, a very dangerous, and I have to, in my own mind, a very dangerous connection. Quality of life. You can have such good quality of life and spending not a lot of money because you have the quality of life of, of working on your inner life and working on the relationships in your community, which fulfill you tremendously and learning creative ways to do what you have, arts and crafts or whatever it is. So anyway, enoughness and compassion. How much do you actually need and can you lessen your needs, uh, practice noticing not at least not expanding your financial needs over time because that's dangerous so then you have to charge more money you have to try to get more people to buy from you and that's all exhausting enoughness let's see how we can live a rich life without having to spend more okay and if, in fact spending less if possible and it is possible because then it uses our creativity to say how can we spend less and yet feel even more fulfillment so enoughness is one is one side of things and then compassion Compassion, what I mean by this is you have two, you've had two experiences in your life when it comes to buying things. Experience one, okay? Experience one is you uh, are talking to somebody trying to sell you their services and then they tell you their price. Maybe, maybe you just experienced this with my, with my price. Someone tells you the price and you're like, sticker shock. Like, my God, that's so much money. So you feel some stress and you feel some like thinking about making those payments, you feel some stress. Okay, so that's that's not a good experience, right? From the buyer side, and of course, the seller feels like the seller subconsciously or consciously sees the reaction of the prospective client. So they, they don't like the price. It's it sounds like a lot to them. Okay, sticker shock. So that's one experience. Is both sides don't have a good emotional experience of 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 that price. The second experience is when you are looking to buy from somebody. And they tell you their price, and you're like, oh my God, that's such a great deal. Oh my gosh. Like, I have this all day long with people on Fiverr, right? F I V E R R.com. If you've never used Fiverr, you should definitely explore, take a, take a couple hours to explore Fiverr and what's there. Now, not everything there I endorse. Uh, do not buy SEO services from Fiverr. Well, not, not. Just be careful. Just be careful. Don't buy any likes or fans or get people who say they're going to promote your business. Don't buy any promotion services on Fiverr in terms of people promoting your business on mentioning you in an article or tweeting you out to their million followers. That's all that can be dangerous because they're getting you fake fans and bots and all that stuff. So, but you know, we should buy on Fiverr research, internet research. Okay. Internet research. I just bought and I'm trying to figure out um, the best socially responsible mutual funds right now. And I paid somebody 30 bucks on Fiverr. Uh, she charged me 15. I gave her a $15 tip and she like gave me this um, great research. I'm like, Oh my God, I can't, how can you be charging $15? You know, her, she started at $5. I'm like, she, she, she says she lives in the U S now I doubt that, but her English is excellent. So I'm like, how are you? So in this case, like I, I'm looking out for her as a buyer. I'm like, how is this such a good deal? Like, are you okay? Like that is the experience that we all want from both sides, right? Like as a buyer, you're like, wow, business, how can you charge me such a good deal? Are you okay? Can I tip you more? Can I, how can I, how can I make sure that you're going to stay in business and you're going to be taking care, feeling taken care of. And then from the, from the seller side, they have this experience of the buyer just oh, so great. You know, like the seller, the seller, I, you know, it, in the case that I'm trying to, um, trying to promote the idea that the seller is coming from a place of compassion, compassion for, for his or her market to say, you know, I'm not going to charge what the market will bear. I'm going to charge the least that I can. You never heard that from a business coach before. I'm going to charge the least that I can that still meets my needs. Okay. And the least that I can, and what is a good deal, it depends of course on the market rate. So there is such a thing as a market rate, you know, uh, when I, in my mind, I'm thinking, God, if I hire a virtual assistant, they're at least what, if, you know, what decent ones, at least $25 an hour. So if someone on Fiverr is going to do this research for me and she pr produces what I would consider two to three hours at least of research, 
and she's only charging me 15, that, wow, you know, I want to pay her more, right? So, so these two experiences, one is like sticker shock, and you're giving that people, people that experience, they don't like the experience, you don't like the experience, and maybe you, you've been taught to charge what, what you're worth, or charge what the market will bear, or charge the value of your services. And the second experience is, you know, you are trying to charge just based on enoughness and compassion, and the, the buyer goes, my God, such a great deal. That's such a great deal. Now that's based on the market rate, which is why I tell you the market rate for my hourly coaching is, you know, at least two hundred dollars an hour. I mean, yes, maybe there are some people at my level that charge one hundred and fifty or one hundred and twenty-five an hour, and maybe I could, you know, I could learn something from that. Now I charge two hundred because I'm I'm trying not to have one on one clients anymore. I'm trying to I, I I'm very much uh, decreasing my number of one on one clients, and I'm doing just the group and the courses, but. But yeah, there are probably people at my level that charge 150, 125 an hour. Um, but there are also very much people at my level who are charging 250, 300, 350, 500, and even a thousand dollars an hour. So there is such a the way that compassion in in pricing works is based on the market rate. And if you are pricing yourself below the market rate, or at least you know you're charging the same market rate, but you're giving even more, then there's a sense of wow. From the from the buyer, a sense of I want to take care of you. The, the you know the less you charge based on the market rate, the more people are like, what a great deal! I want to take care of you. I want to spread the word. The higher you charge based on market rate, people are like sticker shock. And and of course you might say, well, my clients don't know the market rate, which is up to you to educate them. Which is why I'm educating you on what my hourly rate is. Typically, you know, all the way up to thousand dollars an hour. Five hundred is not unusual. Two fifty certainly not unusual. And then to, I charge 200. So I'm, I'm like, you know, middle, low market rate for, for, my, for my experience level and my reputation. That's the other thing, branding, reputation. Branding is one of those things that will, uh, will make people go, well, I should pay you this much. But it's like, look at your branding. Your branding is amazing. For me, I have a sort of um, a priority to make my branding minimalistic. Something I, I create my website on Weebly, which any of you can do, right? It's so easy to create a website like mine. It's low brand, low branding, low like not premium branding. Mine is super minimalistic, low branding, simple, simple anyway. So if I branded myself like some of my peers, you think, well, George, you should charge at least five hundred an hour because look at your branding is amazing. But I'm trying to my priority is to, is to run a business in a way that's easier for you to repeat it easier for you to duplicate it. So that's why I charge, you know, not as much as some of my peers do. But branding does matter and luxury branding that doesn't feel right to me. For some people it might feel right. You know, I saw a guy on YouTube like uh, Boss in the Bentley. That's his YouTube videos. Is he's like dressed up in a tuxedo, riding in a Bentley. That's how he makes his videos. And so then of course people think, well I should pay you at least a thousand dollars an hour, right? Because look at you, you have your Bentley, right? So, but that's not me. That's not me, right? So, um, think about what is authentic to you as for branding. Think about what your market rate is, and then meaning what other people similar to you, similar experience level, similar branding, or just let's just say similar experience level as you, similar reputation as you. What are they charging? Now, if you can charge less than that, bless blessings to you because you'll you'll give people that experience of what a great deal you are. They're going to advocate for you. They're going to take care of you. Okay. So I hope this is helpful. And um, next time you hear, charge what you're worth. You know, don't blame that person. Just realize that they haven't really thought it through, what that really means on a philosophical and not just philosophical, but practical level. Because I've had so many clients follow that advice of charging what they're worth. And then they see their business going down. They're like, why aren't people hiring me? I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, my, my program is only $10,000. I've seen other people do a $25,000 program. Mine's only $10,000. Where, where do you get that idea? $10,000 program. What, where the F did you get that idea? Well, so-and-so. Well, is so-and-so your metric of success or your own definition? You know, and look around. There's so many more other metrics of success that you can borrow from, not just so-and-so or such-and-such high, high-priced coach that, that taught you. There's a bunch more people like me. Who are teaching you something a little bit different that will give your customers a sense of my god this is such a great deal such a great deal that's what i want your clients and customers to say from from what you're offering right 
All right, so thanks for those who are joining me here. Um, Carissa, Alejandra, Stacy, Noe, Captain, and Sharon, thank you all so much. Uh, Rochelle and Martha, um, let's see here. Elena, great to see you here. So just kind of let me call out some of the comments here that I'm seeing. Um, okay, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Alejandra says, you know, I've also heard people say, I charge more because I can employ more people and people have the idea that if it costs more, it's better. Okay, so that's actually a, a valid point. Uh, when it comes to services that many of us are offering, it's not like people are buying cereal or toilet paper where they know that, you know, a box of cereal should not cost $100. It should cost somewhere around, you know, between $3 to $10, a bit premium cereal or whatever, right? So it's not like that. People aren't, it's not a household price, the pricing is not a household knowledge, what, what you and I uh, offer. And so naturally, if, if pricing is not, a, if the pricing of a product is not conventional wisdom, then higher pricing, people will think means higher quality. It's true. People will think it's higher quality if you charge more. Um, and people will tend to take it more seriously if you charge more. That is all true. My problem with all this is people tell that to you when they're actually using the higher price to justify, they, don't, they probably don't even know this, but they have this ulterior motive of trying to make more money because they're trying to keep up with such and such high priced coach. Um, so they're using all these rationales to say, like, oh, I'm charging because people, will, you'll take it more seriously if I charge you more, but really I just trying to like, my self esteem needs, you know, or I'm trying to make more money because I'm trying to buy a better car. You know, or I'm trying to go on a vacation because such and so went on a vacation. It makes me feel bad. I didn't go on such a, you know, they, that's, don't, it's, that's, it's true. So what, what, what is, what, what you need to, so how do we then think about that? Okay, let's think this through. If you find that your clients, that you have plenty of, okay, number one, if you have a lot of clients and you find that they aren't taking you, your, the work as seriously as you would like them to, Okay, if both are true, then I believe you should charge more. Because if you charge more, you won't. You, you still have. You you probably have enough clients. Let's say you have more clients and you you know what to handle, which I I do now. Which is why I'm kind of charging more now because I I have a waiting list, right? It's like okay, I need to charge a bit more so people take my office, office seri services more seriously, and. Uh, you know, and if even if I charge more and a few people say, oh, I'm not going to work with you anymore, George, I, I still have enough clients. OK, so if you're in my situation where you have a waiting list and you would like people to take your services more seriously, please charge more. Everybody else should follow the advice of the rest of this video, which is to charge under the market rate, if at all possible. So people go, my God, what a good deal. I'm going to spread the word about you until you have a waiting list. And then you should raise your rates. Okay, so I hope that makes sense because it really. I think this is if you know that's a that's a, uh, it's going to be better for you financially actually. So um, okay, thank you, <laughs> Captain says George. The message in this video can pass for a sermon in church. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, we're having business church here. Uh, amen. Um, let me pass around a hat now. <laughs> Okay, now look at your neighbor. You got to put in the hat as, as at least as much as they are. <laughs> okay, I'm joking here. All right, okay, so with that, I'm gonna end this video. Thank you so much for joining me. And remember, you are worth an infinite amount. Do not tie, be careful, be, be wary of how your worth and self-esteem and your esteem of others is tied to how much is being charged, how much you charge, how much they charge. Separate the two. And remember, the expansion of the soul does not have to do with how much money you're making or how much you're spending. So get creative with how you expand your soul and not always tied to financial transactions. Okay, so with that, I wish you truly, I wish you well and see you in the next video. Take care.